The James Webb Telescope weighs as much as a school bus, and its sun shield is the size of a tennis court. It's now a million miles from Earth, and we'll be able to look back 13.5 billion years to when the first galaxies were being formed. Gregory Robinson is program director for the James Webb Space Telescope at NASA. He's also a finalist for this year's Samuel J. Hyman Service to America medals. Greg, welcome to the program. Glad to be here, Mimi. Thanks for having me. You've just been named to Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. That puts you on the same list as President Biden and Oprah Winfrey. Do you want to comment about that? <laughs> so first, when I, when I saw my name on the list, after going through the long list, uh, I asked myself, why am I here? Uh, but uh, I'll tell you, following up from the Sammy's reception, seeing all of the great work that's being done in government and different agencies and individuals, then I said, well, maybe I should be here based on this huge accomplishment. Um, so yeah, that's my thought. Well, let's start, let's talk about the telescope itself. Um, tell us about the purpose of the James Webb Telescope and what is NASA lear hoping to learn from it? So the purpose of the telescope, it's, it's a follow-on to Hubble, and Hubble has been around more than 30 years. It's brought us amazing science and images of our great universe. Uh, Webb is 100 times more powerful, if you could imagine that. So it's gonna allow us to see deeper into the universe, uh, further back, a lot clearer, because we have infrared, so we can see through the smoke and gook of space. So it's gonna show us the early formation of early stars, early galaxies, and the one, two, three hundred million years after the Big Bang. So, so are we so, really going to be able to look back and see like how the, the universe started? Uh, certainly not far after it started. A uh, hundred million years is still a long time. <laughs> it's so, but in space, uh, space time, as we said, it's, it's hundred million years is not that much when you look at 14 billion years. Uh, but yes, we will be able to, uh, just a few months ago, Hubble uh, showed us a, a star that was 900 million years after the Big Bang. Still blows my mind. You know, it's all very cool, and space exploration is great, but will this telescope give any tangible economic benefits to the American taxpayer? Do they get any return on their investment from this? So you think about the, the textbooks. Think about what we've learned uh, from science over the many years, certainly in the last 50 years uh, from science. So a lot of these things help our economy through the development process, the technology that's spun off into uh, commercial applications. So I'm sure there would be a lot of that. We have amazing new optical technology on web that's already being used uh, for ophthalmology. And, and I'm sure there would be many more. Uh, so uh, that's one piece of it, the, the economic benefit. But just the science part the, and the, uh, the motivation, uh, if you look at after Apollo, all of the the kids that went into engineering and science uh, schools. Uh, and I'm sure this would do the same thing from an astronomy astrophysics standpoint. And just learning more about physics. We've learned a lot from people several hundred years ago. We, we will learn a lot more uh, going forward. When you took over the project in 2018, it was way behind schedule and way over budget. Uh, my understanding actually that it was supposed to originally cost one billion at launch and launch in 2007. I mean, that's that's pretty bad. It's it was way over budget. Um, what was what was causing the problems? Was it was it technical problems? Was it management problems? Was it budgetary? So there have been uh, multiple incarnations of of the cost and schedule. Uh, so the one billion dollars was in the early days, and we were still in early in what we call formulation, early in the development, uh, and then that. It was baseline at a, at a different amount with a different schedule. Um, in 2010, 2011, uh, the last big rebaseline before I took over uh, was uh, to be launched in October of 2018. So I came on in, in 2018. Um, so many, many different reasons. One is just maturing the technology. We have 10 new technologies on there, which, which is amazing to have that many new technologies, never been developed and or flown before. Uh, so technology, sometimes physics takes its own time. The other one is um, this stuff is difficult. Even once we get the technology matured, to put all of this into a system to make sure it's going to work. Um, uh, mission success was high priority, so it had to work. Uh, so it, it's, it's uh, quite complex. Uh, we, we, we 
we can do better in some of our cost and schedule estimating as well. There's a lot of activity now in the agency to make that better. Uh, so, um, so it's a combination of factors. So how did you, like, where did you start? How did you start working through the problems? Well, w one thing is when I came on, we had a, we were just starting an independent review board, mostly external people, external to NASA, who are very well known in the business. They gave us a lot of recommendations, 32 recommendations, so that helped a lot. Uh, so I had to work through all of those, the ones I thought were credible, and all 32 were. Um, so there were, there were two or three areas I consider uh, the, the most important. One was uh, having transparency throughout the system, from the lowest level all the way up to me, to the, to the ninth floor, the administrative suite, and, and to our stakeholders, OMB and Congress. So uh, one was creating that, that transparency. Uh, sometimes we, we report and or answer questions, and we answer the words and not the commander's intent. Uh, that was one big piece, and then just uh, mastering the fundamentals, uh, not making uh, what we call human errors over long periods of time. All of us are human, so we make those. Uh, so we try to mitigate human errors so you don't have to go back and do rework. That takes a lot of time. Uh, and there were a few other areas, but I'll, I'll, those are the, the big two for me. Greg, federal contractors obviously are a big part of making this uh, project successful. What issues did you have to work through on that side? So on, on the contractor side, uh, they do a lot of our development, uh, as you mentioned. Um, some of the same things I mentioned earlier, one in particular is uh, mastering the fundamentals, uh, reducing uh, human errors, mistakes, um, and some forward planning uh, beyond the near-term activity. So when we transition from one phase to another, uh, everything would be prepared and ready to go. and so you can just keep moving through the schedule. Those are two major areas. Well, tell us about the uh, James Webb Telescope deployment on uh, Christmas Day of last year. So on Christmas morning, um, a very special morning, uh, one because uh, of Christmas. Uh, two, we, we launched um, from French Guiana, uh, Karoo, French Guiana in South America. Wait, why did you choose Christmas Day? Isn't that a federal holiday? <laughs> Well, it kind of ended up that way. We were scheduled to launch uh, in late fall. Um, and, you know, one small technical reason or another, we, we slipped a little bit. As we got closer and the weather bit us, we didn't expect weather, uh, high winds, and particularly rainy also, but the high winds kept us from launching. So we ended up on uh, Christmas morning. Um, an amazing launch. Uh, so Ariane 5 put us in the right orbit. Uh, so we didn't have to use a lot of propellant after we separated, uh, which is good long term. Uh, so since then, uh, we, we've deployed all of the deployables in that first 29 days. That was a really big deal. That was the most complex, challenging piece. Wait, but how did you feel on that day when, oh, on that day, at I, that I, moment, that you were like, this is a successful launch and we're good? Oh, I was totally elated. Uh, after I saw separation, uh, that was a huge satisfaction. Uh, I was proud of the team, happy for the team, because I'm the baby on web, so I've been on four years, and many people have been on for 20 years. So I was ex extremely excited for the team itself um, and, and happy for the world. I often say the, the world gave us this mission to do, and that was our opportunity to give it back to the world. So that's really how I felt about it. So it also achieved near-perfect alignment uh, of its optical system. Explain that. So after the deployments, uh, we have to uh, get the mirrors uh, aligned and focused. This is an 18-segmented mirror te uh, telescope. So each mirror collects light uh, from the universe, and then it, all of it has to process into one single mirror. So that took about two months to do that. Of course, we use our science instruments to process that information. So our near-infrared camera, near cam, we call it, uh, processed a lot of that. And since then, other instruments are doing the same thing. So it took us about two months to get that alignment and focus and, and everything just right for the mirrors. And it was almost perfect. Has, there, has the telescope discovered anything so far? Have we seen images come back yet? So we've, we've seen many images. Uh, these are not science images per se. This is for focusing, getting the instruments uh, aligned and calibrated. Uh, but yes, we've seen many. Uh, some we've actually published, so you can go out and see some of those. And, and one thing you will see is comparison of uh, two former or older satellites looking at the same thing that Webb is looking at today, and you can see the difference in clarity. 
it's it's mind-boggling so tell us about the timeline for the telescope um, what will it be doing how long will it be in orbit so we're a few weeks from completing commissioning and then we go into science operations mode for the life of the of the mission uh, so that's coming pretty soon so what's uh, so commissioning what's involved commissioning in that? after launch and separation we do check out get the mirrors ready get the instruments ready uh, all of that's uh, pretty close to done. Again, in a few weeks, we'll be done with all of that. And then we go into science mode. And that's normal for all of our satellites. Uh, different timelines. Some just take a few weeks. Some take two or three months. And this one is six months. Um, so we're almost there. Then we go into what we call the first year of science. We call it cycle one. We have just under 300 uh, different science activities um, from around the world. People compete for those. And they will actually start doing science. So all the images and information we get back after we go to first light coming pretty soon will be from the from the actual science community uh, the telescope was designed for a five-year lifetime uh, we know we have consumables uh, for more than 10 years and the limiting consumable is fuel and now we know we have enough fuel long beyond 10 years so looking forward to that so you think it'll be in orbit for how long um, probably, um, certainly more than 20 years, I think it will be, and, and we think even longer than that. You started your career at NASA in 1989. Why did you join NASA, and why have you stayed so long? So I joined, uh, one, because uh, uh, some of my uh, old colleagues from college uh, I worked at NASA. Uh, we've always talked about it, uh, the, the amazing work that was being done. Um, at the time, I was looking to do something different, although it was still early in my career. So that's why I joined. And if, if you look at NASA, I think nine years running, best place to work in government. That's not just, just uh, talk. It really is a great place to work. The mission always drives us. So it's easy to get up in the morning. You look forward to the next challenge. So that's why I've stayed so long. And I know that you've got a, an engineering background and a man management background. What do you think needs to happen to encourage more African Americans to get into the STEM field and, and to move into higher levels, um, especially in the government? Well, I would say in general, uh, there's more work to be done in the earlier years, uh, in the elementary and middle and high school years to continue to uh, funnel people into that pipeline. Uh, there are a lot of factors that, that kind of uh, deter that or diminish uh, that motivation. Uh, so there's some work to be done there. Uh, at the, in the workplace level, government and industry, uh, one is we have to increase, um, we have to increase engagement with, I believe, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities the old saying, you know, the judge said, why did you rob the bank? Well, that's where the money is. <laughs> so uh, that's a huge opportunity to increase uh, STEM uh, workforce from the HBCUs. And we're doing a few things in those areas, but there's a lot more work to be done. All right, Greg, thank you so much for coming in and, and for all your work on this project. Uh, thank you, Mimi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.